Hello, Mary. Thanks for coming in. We have a Women's Aid representative on today to talk about the Two Into You campaign. So I'd love if you could just start off by explaining what the Two Into You campaign is. Yeah, so uh, Two Into You is Women's Aid's campaign focused on uh, young people, in particular young women. So that kind of 18 to 25 age group. Um, So I suppose we started the campaign because uh, about 10 years ago, the campaign is actually 10 years old. Um, Happy birthday. Oh, thank you. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So we started hearing from a lot more young women using our services. So using the helpline and one-to-one services um, to tell us that they were in unhealthy or abusive relationships. So we really wanted to make a campaign that was really focused on that age group uh, to kind of talk about like how they talk about relationships and the particular like language that they would use. Because often, I suppose, when we think about like domestic violence and domestic abuse, you know your mind will go straight to like an older woman or somebody who's married or living with a partner but Mm. actually um you know from our work with survivors uh we know that you don't have to be living with your partner for them to be abusive to you um and often you know the abuse can be online um emotional like the ways that young women will experience abuse might be quite different to say somebody who's living with their partner so with the campaign we're trying to i suppose bring attention to the fact that this does happen in young relationships um, to teach young people what the red flags look like so they can spot it early on and also to provide uh, support to people who are worried about their own relationship or a friend's relationship. So we have a special um, dedicated website for young people uh, run by Women's Age and it's 2intoyou.ie and that's kind of where we host all of our information and resources and support. And I always, when I was younger, And I've experienced abuse in a relationship before, but I always thought that domestic violence was just actually physical abuse and physical violence. So can you talk about more about the other types of domestic abuse that people do experience and what maybe is, uh, for lack of a better word, um, what's the most like popular one that people ring in with? I don't know what else to say. (laughs) The the most 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 pervade, yeah, the most most common, sorry. (laughs) The most popular. The popular one. No, what's the most common one that people come in for help with? Yeah, so there's definitely misconception that abuse is physical. You know, that there needs to be like a bruise there or a black eye or some type of mark. But actually, um, emotional abuse is by far the most common form of abuse against young women. That's harder to prove as well. Absolutely. And it's something that really eats away at, you know, your sense of self, your confidence, your ability to listen to your gut and trust your gut. Um, which is really the thing, you know, that keeps you safe. So actually, um, we did some research on like the prevalence of abuse amongst young people. And we found that one in five young women have been abused by a partner or ex aged 18 to 25. Mm. Um, And that's compared to one in 11 young men. And, you know, abuse also happens in LGBT relationships as well. Um, But predominantly it is young women experiencing abuse by male partners or male exes Mm. um and of that one in five nine in ten had experienced emotional abuse so that is a huge huge number you know think of your friend group so most likely you know there's somebody who is either going through this or gone through this and the thing with emotional abuse is it really wears you down and it can be hard to spot and it makes you feel like you're going absolutely crazy so Mm. one of the things that um people kind of talk more about now is gaslighting So what gaslighting is, is it's when uh, the person you're seeing basically makes you feel like you're going crazy. So they'll kind of question, make you question everything. They'll deny things that have happened or they'll say you're being dramatic or blowing things out of proportion. Um, For example, I was speaking to a survivor the other day and she said that, you know, her partner had pushed her and they turned around and said, what are you talking about? I I didn't do that. And she said, "You, what are you saying? You literally just pushed me. And he's like, no, 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 I've got a, I've got a split personality. So it's these constant excuses or excusing of this really unhealthy and manipulative behavior um, that can just make you become a completely different person. And it happens slowly, slowly over time to the point where you don't realize um you know, what you're going through is abuse and also you don't recognize the person that you are anymore. Mm. Manipulation is definitely like a huge thing that you 
can't recognize it's not like like if you were being in if you're in a relationship and like domestic abuse and you're hit you recognize that like automatically you're like Mm -hmm. you just hit me but when you're being manipulated it's hard to know it's hard to know because they're so good at mind games and you know when you start to question yourself and when you start to feel like oh am I crazy and it's so much harder to talk to someone about it because when someone's telling you you're being crazy and you're like, oh, maybe I am being crazy. Especially the person you love. And I think that's yeah. also so excluded from these conversations is that because people are always like, why didn't you leave them? Mm-hmm. Well, you know, why didn't you get out your, yourself out of that situation? It's kind of your own fault. Yeah. Whereas like in, you obviously get into these relationships because they're charming. They have redeemable qualities and you are, are in love with them. So that's why you stay with them. Mm-hmm. And things just get worse. And yeah. I suppose you... I know you mentioned, um, or you teach about love bombing as well on to you. You took the words out, out of <laughs> my mouth. Um, you're dead right. So that I think is something that we don't talk about that, you know, it is what makes it so difficult is because the person who's doing this to you is supposed to be the person who loves and cares about you most. So that can be a really, really difficult thing to kind of deal with and to rationalize in your head. Um, and, you know, we want to think the best of our partners. So a lot of the time, that's why people will turn it on themselves, say, this is my fault. You know, I'm obviously not being sensitive enough around them or, you know, I should try and keep the peace more or maybe I shouldn't have talked to, you know, my guy friend. Um, but, you know, really what that is, is it's your partner making you change how you live your life. So that is manipulation and it, it's course of control. So with with love bombing in particular, like that's a really good example of how it can be really hard to see that, um, especially when you're like caught up in that honeymoon phase. So love bombing is when um, the person that you're seeing or starting to see kind of like bombards you with love and attention and affection Um, you know gifts maybe they want to spend all their time with you maybe they want to move really fast in the relationship things like that and like that can feel really normal but if you feel like you can't say no or like you owe them something in return then that's where that line has been crossed because what that says is they don't respect your boundaries they don't respect your decisions on you know how fast you want to move um you know how you want to spend your time So that would be a real red flag for how you will be treated later on. So they're kind of testing those boundaries. But the other example of love bombing as well would be, you know, say um, your boyfriend or girlfriend, you know, um, brings you out for dinner or to the cinema or something. And then you go home and they say, you know, you're not in the mood to have sex with them or like be intimate or do whatever. They say, well, you know, I was so nice to you today. Why won't you like have sex with me? Do you not love me? And they use that as a, you know, tool of exactly this way to kind of um, make you more open to changing what your decisions Mm. are. Mm -hmm. So again, it's that coercion. Because it's a conscious thing that uh, cults used to do. They took on love bombing and they studied it. And when they wanted to bring in new people to the cults, they would shower them with love and gifts and tell them how beautiful they are. Mm. And it's the same sort of thing in relationships. But do you think that, and I've always wondered this, are men doing this consciously? Or do they think that, or do you think that they're aware that they're doing something wrong? Or do, they, do you think it's so normalized maybe that they're like, this is something I deserve or this is how you're supposed to behave in society because it's patriarchal and maybe they think that they deserve that ownership over women? I'm not sure. Yeah, so really, you know, regardless of whether it's conscious or unconscious, it is happening. Yeah, Okay. yeah. But you're dead right, you know, young men are growing up in a patriarchal society. They're being fed messages, you know, through their families, through their peers, through the media, what they're consuming, um, who they're watching online. You know, that is teaching them uh, ideas of what it means to be a man. Um, And unfortunately, you know, in the society that we live in, men are told that they're entitled to parent control in all aspects of their life. Even if they don't feel that the system is set up to benefit them. So of course that's going to feed into their intimate relationships as well. Um, so I suppose it's it's less about whether it's unconscious or subconscious. Um, it, it happens mm. um, and that really shows, I suppose, why it is majority women who are experiencing this by men. And actually men um, who experience violence more often than not experience violence at the hands of other men. Mm. So it's that same system that's um, telling men that, you know, violence is okay, that you're entitled to power, you're entitled to control. And in order to gain and maintain that power and control, you know, 
you can use any means necessary. Mm. Would you say there's a difference between, say, for example, like someone who is like a narcissist and then someone who is, say, for example, you're in a relationship and they're, you know, emotionally abusing someone, but they're not actually aware that they're doing it? Like, do you think, because like I find like, sociopaths and narcissists their motive they kind of have a motive with life and they everything is tactical and they they think everything through and then there's people who they could be emotionally abusive but they don't realize they are and do you think there's a difference but like would you separate them in categories or yeah so narcissism is something that's been coming up like more and more recently not through the services but in like social media the way people talk about abuse Um, And while I think it's great people talking about red flags and, you know, different um, behaviors, unhealthy behaviors, there is tends to be this thing now where in narcissism, it's kind of used as this excuse of why people act a certain way. And the danger with that is it, it can get very muddy because then we get into a place of, oh, well, they were only acting that way because they're a narcissist. Oh, they were only acting that way because they have mental illness. They were only acting that way because they were drunk and actually research both nationally and internationally says that, for example, people who are drunk, as an example, will, um, you know, they won't be abusive to other people when they're drunk. They will wait until they're with their partner to exert that abuse over them. So I suppose it's not it's not about, um, you know, separating them and saying, okay, well, this person is, you know, um, a narcissist and they're aware of what they're doing and this person isn't a narcissist and they're not aware of what they're doing. The point is, is the abuse is happening. Yeah. So, you know, I think when when we talk about it that way, it kind of diverts the attention away from the person that it's happening to, who is the person we should be focusing on. And it puts it on the person who is doing it. Yeah, for sure. Mm. For sure. I I like had been in a relationship and I experienced love bombing, but I didn't know what it was. Mm. And it was like I met I met the lad and he told me the same day he loved me. Like it was bizarre. Mm. Like, and I did, I'd never experienced that before. Mm. And it was like, I love you. Then arrived at my work the next day with flowers and was like, like, do you not love me? He actually asked me, he was like, do you not, do you not love me? And Mm. I was like, I, I, I guess. But we think this is romance. I thought yeah. that like I thought this was love stuff. at first sight. You know, I was like, oh my God, you think this that's is normal. Yeah. But like love at first sight is actually probably dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And that's the thing, you know, especially if it's like your first relationship, like it can that can feel really exciting. Mm. But you have nothing to compare it to. So that's where the danger is. And as well, you know, young people, um, they they don't understand that um things like abuse. Um, like violence apply to them so again you know we think about like domestic violence we think about older people um, but abuse that happens uh, in young relationships it's kind of excused or normalized well it's like oh well everyone's partner acts like acts like that or you know it's normal to like look through your partner's phone or for them to know all your social media uh, passwords things like that like in movies you know rom-coms like what we all grew up with you know it's the guy chasing the girl down like filling her house with flowers like asking her out like 20 times Mm. like breaking her down until she says yes like Mm. that is manipulation yeah Yeah. it is it really is i never thought about it that way oh my god (laughs) yeah so i suppose like with two into you we are talking about like red flags all the unhealthy behaviors but we're also trying to celebrate like healthy relationships Mm -hmm. because it's one thing to know what an unhealthy relationship is but it's also good to know what a healthy one looks like so that's what you can strive for that's what you can work on with the person you're going out with so you know the early stages of a relationship are a good time to kind of test those out so like just say you start going out with someone and you're out with your friends um for a coffee or something and your phone is like blowing up they're sending you loads of text messages um and you know later on you say look I was with my friend like I kind of like you know if I'm out with someone to kind of concentrate on that um conversation and not be on my phone and if they say you know oh my god no problem like sorry I didn't realize um like that's that would be a green flag Um, But if they kind of get defensive, they say, well, you know, you're spending way too much time with them or why don't you want to like message me back? Do you not like me? Um, Why don't you just want to spend all my time, all your time with me? Or, you know, even like more insidious than that, they might just say, I just love when it's us together all the time, Mm. you Mm. know? 
Yeah, that's the scary thing as well, because you're like, oh my God, they love me so much that they want to just be with me. And then that's where the manipulation comes in because you're like, I must be like, this must be perfect. Like he loves me so much that he mm. just wants to spend. But when you're spending just your time with them and then they get annoyed at you with your friends or whatever, that's when no one really realizes because you're, you're in a new relationship and you're in honeymoon phase. Mm. But technically like you're not really allowed to spend time with your friends, which like w we and you have experienced that with friends or maybe mm. ourselves that like when you're in the honeymoon stage and your friend or yourself is spending all their time with their boyfriend, but it doesn't, it doesn't look toxic because mm. you're like, oh, they're in the honeymoon stage. That's where I find the, like the difficulty, like how do you know when your friend, if they're not vocalizing it because they can't see, how do you know when your friend is in trouble? Yeah. Mm. That's the tough thing. Yeah. So I get this question all the time. Um, and I suppose, you know, the first thing to think about is for people to learn the red flags now, you know, before you're in a relationship so that when you are kind of in that honeymoon phase, you know, hopefully there will be little, um, you know, flags going up in your head if there are things that you see that are a little bit questionable. Um, but with friends, you know, if you haven't seen them in a while, just remind them that you're there, you know, text them, say hi. Um, look, I know you're all loved up, but like would love to meet you for a coffee or just checking in. It's just reminding them that you're there. Um, and I suppose, you know, the more the relationship goes on, like if there are things that you're spotting or it, even if it's not things you're spotting, because abuse can hide really, you know, under the surface. Um, often like people who are going through it, they won't recognize it as abuse. It's just become the total norm for them. So that's why like keeping connections with friends is so massively important because they can be that kind of mirror, that sounding board to, um, for you, if you're going through this for you to see, okay, maybe it's not normal what's happening to me. Um, so I'm not saying, you know, for everyone to go out and if they're worried about a friend to go and, you know, shout at them and say, oh my God, you're in an abusive relationship. You need to leave them. That's the last thing you should do. Yeah. You know, leaving is never as easy as just leaving. Mm. It's far more complicated than that. Um, but really keeping that connection can be absolutely huge because when you're in an abusive relationship, you become more and more and more isolated. And it's not just the isolation, like the time away from friends. It's also the thought process of, well, I haven't seen them for that long. They're not going to want to see me now or thinking that they don't want to spend time with you. Maybe your partner is saying, you know, well, they're a bad influence on you or they don't want to hang out with you. You know, there, there can be so much um, uh, anxiety around the whole friend thing. So for you to even just check in with your friend could be monumental for them. Um, but, you know, it can feel like a tricky thing to bring up with bring up with a friend because, you know, maybe they get defensive or um, they might, you know, kind of shut it down and they might, you know, ghost. So it's really to just kind of keep that connection there. Keep checking in. Um, but on uh, the website, um, the Two and Two website, we have a whole guide there um, and it's kind of do's and don'ts. Um, ways to approach the conversation, things to say, things not to say, if you are worried about a friend. So it's the help a friend section on the website. And also, um, the there's, a, I haven't said this yet, but there's a chat service on the website. Um, and if you're worried about not just your own relationship, but a friend's relationship or, you know, a cousin, sister, whatever, that service is there for you as well, as well as the uh, national helpline number um from women's age so like that service is there if you want to just talk through you know things that you're worried about with someone in your life just know you don't need to know all the answers you also don't need to know 100 percent that what there is what they're experiencing is abuse because if anything feels off at all it's worth kind of touching base with someone and just again reminding them that you're there of course yeah um i also wanted to ask about uh the idea that there's no perfect victim Mm. Uh, because when I was experiencing abuse and I spoke up about it, uh, well, if, it took me ages to speak up anyway, because he was manipulating me and telling me that I was wrong. And I genuinely thought that I was in the wrong. So I was like, oh, he's treating me like this because I'm a bad partner. And then and eventually when I did speak up about it, um, a person very close to me was like, oh, what did you do to him? You know, that was the first question that I was met, met with. So then I stayed in the relationship and I didn't speak up again. And then a few years later, I spoke about it on the internet 
to try and encourage other people to speak about their experience, mm. um, which I then deleted about an hour later because all the comments were mostly men were like, well, you did the a, a X, Y, and Z, so you deserved what he did to you. Um, oh so is, do you have a lot of that? And I just want to like, if I could do anything from this podcast is encourage people if they think that they're in the wrong to speak up and seek help. Because if I knew about something like two and to you when I was at that age, I definitely would have availed of it. But back then, like in the internet or social media wasn't even that popular back yeah. then. Like I didn't even, I don't even think I had Instagram, you know? So now with like TikTok and Instagram, it's so much easier to find this information. It's so accessible. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, if you had anything to say about the, especially with, you know, with the Amber Heard case, it could be, uh, you know, m made an example of by, well, if they, nothing's happening for them and they didn't receive justice, like, why would I ever speak up? Um, but can you just talk about, I'd love to know what the uh, positives that can come from contacting Women's Aid, even if you don't want to, you know, press charges or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Really, it's about, you know, the fact that you don't need to do this on your own. Like it can be really frightening to realize that you're in an abusive relationship and it's will take time for you to, I suppose, deal with that um, yourself. And it can be really scary to think, OK, this is happening to me. What do I do? Because very often when you leave the relationship, the abuse can get so much worse um, because, you know, your partner will see uh, you leaving as a threat, you seeking support or reaching out to family as a threat. So they might, um, you know, continue to harass you online, like online abuse is a big problem as well. It's that continuation of control. Um, but really, it's about doing things at your own pace and, and having support throughout that process. So we have a lot of services in Women's Aid uh, there that are there to kind of help you work through your relationship or even if it's a past relationship. Um, so, for example, we have like one to one services where you can kind of talk through what you're going through. If you're going through the legal process, we have a court accompaniment service. Um, so somebody can uh, come to come uh, to court with you, um, in, you know, if you don't want to go on your own or if you don't have family or something like that to go with you. We also have um, a drop in service at Dolphin House. So that's if you want to apply for legal protection. And uh, that's, you know, there's no uh, appointments and it's completely free and confidential. Uh, so that service is there as well. But I suppose, um, you know, there's so much shame and stigma around uh, abuse and shame and the fear of not being believed is the most common reason why young women in particular don't come forward about what's happened to them. Because people, it's like a continuation of what their abuser has told them that, you know, no one's going to believe you. You're crazy. You're being over the top. You're being dramatic. This is all in your head. Um, and also they think they deserve it. I think that was a huge problem for me is that I literally thought that I deserved it or that yeah. it was normal. Or that it's like a relationship problem, that it's like, oh, well, this isn't a you problem. It's an us problem, mm. you know, so it becomes kind of the job of both of you to fix it. But the fault of the abuse is uh, the it's only the abuser whose fault it is. Mm. Uh, but you said something about the perfect victim, perfect victim. Yeah. Um. Can you explain that to me? Like the so, perfect victim. So basically, like when someone imagines someone coming for it, this is what the problem was for me when I was in. I'm just using myself in the, as an example. Because I was in an abusive relationship, he basically told me that all my friends were annoying and that they were stupid and annoying. So I was like, yeah, you're totally right. Yeah, because obviously I was in love with him. and I want to spend all my time with him. Of course. So then I was spending less and less time with them to the point where when I came out to speak about it, they were kind of like, what f like fuck off you yeah. you know you cut us out of your life okay so they already didn't like me so but when someone imagines a victim it's like someone who's so nice and everyone loves them and you mm. want to help them whereas when someone actually reaches out for help your first incline inclination is to go with well they could be making it up or okay, yeah, you know yeah. well they did this to them and an another thing was I, I was 17 you know I was texting a boyfriend right um who I'd kissed before and then my ex was or my boyfriend at the time he was going through my phone it was like a normal thing but I'd gone through I was rehearsed in deleting the conversation whereas one morning I forgot so then he this is all in school by the way and he was looking through my phone it was just like a part of our morning routine so he's looking through my phone and then found the messages and chased me down the hall to the point where a teacher saw me in the in the hallway getting pushed up against the locker and she rolled her eyes because I was missing class. Oh my, oh my God. God. You know, so it's real like, 
no one was inclined to believe me. I wasn't very liked in school because I'd cut myself off from these friends. And also I thought that I deserved it because I was texting another boy and I already knew I was doing, doing I felt as if I was doing something wrong because I knew to delete the messages. And I was like, well, that's my, that's a me problem, you know, rather yeah. than him being in the wrong for, you know, checking yeah. your Looking, phone, checking my phone. Stuff, yeah. But that was my first relationship. So yeah. I had no idea. And again, it's constantly that turning it back on you you know, making it your fault. Well, if you weren't texting that guy, then I wouldn't have pushed you up against the locker. Mm. Or if you weren't talking to that guy on a night out, you know, I wouldn't have to check who you've been talking to on social media or I wouldn't have to keep tabs on you and, you know, track your location on Snapchat. Like it's excuse, excuse, excuse. And at the end of the day, when someone is doing those things to you, it's inexcusable. Like that is abuse and that is serious. And I suppose the thing is, is, you know, we need to take these things very seriously because abuse is incredibly dangerous you know at the end of the day unfortunately you could be killed by your partner that is the worst thing that can happen in an abusive relationship we've seen that happen already this year with um, Bruna Fonseca in Cork her ex-partner is being charged with her murder so you know especially when this happens to young people, we need to take it seriously. Just like we need to believe women when they talk about these experiences. It's not easy to talk about these experiences. So we need to listen to women and believe them when mm. they talk about it. And do you think, now I know it could be that more people are reaching out or maybe there are, are, are real um, statistics, but do you think it's getting worse? To be honest, I think abuse has always been there. Um, I think the online space isn't doing us any favours with how women are treated. Online abuse and harassment is huge. Um, also, you know, people like, I don't want to say his name, but we all know that guy who's a big social mm -hmm. media yeah, influencer yeah, who's been arrested. Um, you know, like he is having a huge impact on what guys think is okay. And, um, you know, he thinks it's okay to like own your girlfriend and to treat her like your property. Mm. Like that is absolutely disgusting. Um, but, I'm not sure if it's um, going up, like the numbers are going up. Like we've certainly had more contacts, especially with COVID, you know, that had a huge impact. Mm -hmm. um, and also um, the energy crisis at the moment, you know, with um, bills, things like that. Like if you are living with your partner, like financial abuse um, would be a really big issue. So, you know, if your partner like withholds money or they make you like uh, show them your wages or... You know, there's women like sitting in cold houses right now because their partner won't let them turn the heating on. Mm. Um, but at the same time, I think the numbers that we do know are just the tip of the iceberg because that one in five is just people who, you know, said in an anonymous survey that they had experienced abuse. And the majority of them told them that told us that uh, they'd never told anyone about the abuse that they'd experienced. So not only are there so many people I don't think you've told anyone. There are so many people out there who don't realize they're either in an abusive relationship right now or that they've gone through abuse in the past. Like when I go and do talks and stuff all the time, every time there'll be at least one or two that come up to me and say, oh my God, that relationship I was in two years ago was definitely abusive. Mm. Um, so yeah, I think what we know is is really just the tip of the iceberg. Um, but look, if we can do anything with the campaign, it's to kind of give people the language um, around abuse and red flags and the things to watch out for so that, you know, they could be more equipped to kind of, uh, I suppose, recognize it in their own relationships and, you know, take take them seriously when you see them. Mm, and I think that um, the access accessibility of the internet has made it so much easier to find this information, especially with the two and you. It's so, it's just, it's like, aesthetically beautiful so <laughs> people are going to read it you know yeah, but that's just the fact of life at the moment whereas like if something is daunting and oh. scary they're going to shy away from it whereas to interview makes it so inviting to like learn more and to actually reach out which I really I want to commend you for because I you. I love the campaign um but do you think that there's uh, a dangers with misinformation about abuse as well online with I know with because anyone can upload anything that they want um so have you found that is there anything like um sort of trying to debunk or something the campaign or if there are any issues with it online? No, I think, um, you know, Women's Aid has been around since 1974. We're a very trusted organization. Yeah. Um, and people know like that the amount of survivors that we've helped over the years. Um, 
So no, thankfully we haven't had anyone trying to debunk what we're doing because at the end of the day, I think we're doing a good thing. You know, there's always going to be people out there who will want to try and uh, steer the conversation one way or another. But Mm -hmm. at the end of the day, we're saying, you know, we want young people to have healthy and happy relationships. There's a lot of people out there who aren't. Um, And I suppose, you know, it's it's lovely to hear that you um, really like the campaign and that it's kind of uh, getting the right message across. You know, we work very hard on our messaging so that young people can recognize it as something that applies to them. Um, so, you know, the best way, I think, probably to combat things like, you know, misinformation is to share things from reputable sources. Yeah. So, um, you know, tune to everything we do is based in research. Like we've done two nationally represented studies. This isn't just based on, you know, our work with survivors. Um, like all of the work of Women's Aid is based around the survivor experience. But um, we've also done lots of research. So we know like the types of abuse that are coming up. Um, you know, the duration of abuse, um, the relationship to their abuse or things like that. We have a lot of information. So we try and constantly tailor um, the campaign to what's coming through on the services, what's coming through in our research, also what's coming through, um, you know, in like the zeitgeist or in social media to try and kind of jump on those things like um, Love Island last year. Just randomly, we put up um, a post on Twitter, just kind of calling out some gaslight, very clear gaslighting that we were seeing. And we got so much traction from it. So things like that can be really helpful to kind of click in people's minds that, okay, this is relevant to you. So please do learn it and use it. Mm -hmm. And on that, um, you know, you never know if there's somebody in your life who's going to need to know about you and to you. So if you can um, share, you know, the posts on your, you know, even on your Instagram story, whatever, because you never know who could be swiping through and would need to know, um, you know, what supports out there. And also by you doing that, it's you saying to your friends and your followers and your family, you know, that I don't accept this behavior I don't accept abuse behavior I don't accept violence in any aspect of life I think the whole gaslighting thing is really important because like I actually didn't really know what gaslighting was when I saw it all over the internet do you ever see things and it's like gaslighting queen oh no gatekeep girl boss do you know what I mean like I think sometimes that can be it like discredits the actual term yeah that's yeah that's it and I when I like saw it I was like gaslighting and I I had a completely different like perception on gaslighting and then I remember I was in a relationship and I was absolutely being gaslit is that yeah yeah, yeah. gaslit (laughs) I was being gaslit and I'd say it and I'd be like you're gaslighting me and then they go Oh, you don't even know what that means mm. and I was like well is, is that are you gaslighting me but I did know what it was but then I was manipulated into thinking that I don't even know what that term means so I'm mm. using this wrong and it was like a whole thing but I feel with gaslighting it's all over the internet and you see it and people use it use that term mm. so lightly yeah mm. they do use it so, so lightly. lightly but a huge like, thing in relationships I think for years in the past from what our you know our combos our DMCs mm. is that a lot of women can be made feel dumb or stupid. Yeah. Yeah. And it's yeah. like, you have no idea what you're talking about. Mm, it's, you know? That's a huge yeah. thing. And like, I have been very open. Like I've struggled with dyslexia and dyscalculia like all my life. So that was like a main like attachment to like any relationship that I'd been in it, when they were abusive. It was like, oh, well, you're so dumb. Like you don't even understand what that means. So I've been told all my life that I'd been dumb by teachers, by well, like my parents always told me I was amazing. So <laughs> thank God. But like teachers or like people in school and stuff like that. So it was then going on to like relationships. Mm. They they saw my to fault. Believe it then. Yeah, yeah. And they yeah. latched onto it. So anytime I tried to you know, say, no, 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 you are not treating me right. Like, this isn't right. They'd be like, you're just dumb. Like, you don't understand that. And then that was a huge question for me. And when I started to actually, when I got out of, like, I've been in a fair fair amount of relationships that were very unhealthy and uh, a huge thing, like I went digging. I'd go digging and be like, why on Google? Why is my boyfriend being like mm. this? And like the main things would be like abusive, abusive, abusive. But I'd always think abusive relationships were, you know, physical. Mm. I'd never thought that like emotional abuse would also have that much of a uh, effect on someone when like, I didn't realize I was being emotionally abused, but like I was so sad all the time. And they were like, oh, that's cause you know, you have OCD and you know, like you're, you know what I mean? You're struggling with OCD. That's 
why you're depressed. Like I went and got therapy uh, because they told me I should be in therapy. And then my therapist was like, "Mm, do do you not think that this person's the problem here? And I was like, nope, see you later, left therapy. So like I tried to, and I was also as well like, trying to better myself, thinking that I was the issue in it. And I think a lot of people think when they're abused, as you said, that they deserve it Mm. and that it's their fault. And then like, for example, me being stupid or me being dumb, I was like, oh, well, I obviously deserve this because I'm not educated enough to even like speak up about these things. So I think as well with like friends in these type of relationships, like I have been through it a lot. So when I recognize it, it within like French, like friendships and people going through it, it kind of frustrates me. And though I kind of like tend to give tough love, you know, when yeah. people are in, 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 uh, in relationships, I was going to ask you, like, I know you touched off, like when your friends are in help, but like, for me, it's such a frustrating thing because when I see it happening to someone else, I'm like, oh my God. But then when it's happening to me, I'm like, Mm. let it go over my head so like how would you approach a situation to the extent where like what if they're broken up already and they're still being harassed or they're still being abused but like they're like oh we're broken up like I'm, I don't see him anymore but they're still bing 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 getting text messages and it's like to the point where you're like I want to say something but obviously you can't get involved how would you go about something that way if you know if someone's broken up with someone and they're not recognizing that it's abuse still like they're still being abused yeah I suppose they're still in that mind space of how they've always been treated you know just because you break up it doesn't mean that everything that happened you forget about everything that happened or how you were treated you know um that person might have such a hold on them and like you said you know an abuser will um really hone in on like your vulnerabilities so the things that maybe you feel most insecure about or the things that you're maybe marginalized for like for example if um you know just say you're black okay and uh, a guy is like approaching you and he says I don't normally go for black girls but I'll give you a go so that would like that is a huge red flag so they'll kind of go to these like um uh, ideas in society and pull on those to 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 pick at you or for you know a trans woman they'll say well you're not a real woman you know like we we would hear that yeah that's crazy yeah that. um so i suppose it's you know when you're in this situation or even when you're out of it it can be hard on the outside to to look at someone else and say you know why why don't they just leave because that's what that is mm. but you know it's never as easy as just leaving and you know for those like more marginalized groups the nuances of leaving are even more complex um you could be incredibly dependent not just um like uh you mightn't even be financially dependent emotionally dependent on someone because that person has become your whole world because they have made it that way they've isolated you from everything they have made it all about the relationship so when the relationship ends Obviously, there's going to be some little bit of, okay, well, you know, um, maybe it wasn't that bad. That's why people go back to abusive relationships so often, you know. Mm. Um, So I I suppose really it's about just being compassionate. And, you know, if you are worried about a friend to approach them in a way that's non-judgmental. So we need to leave our own stuff at the door. I'm guilty of that. I'm like, I'm like, why aren't you seeing yeah. this? Because I, I, because I would, I'd recognize it. And I yeah. go, why aren't you seeing this? And then I'd feel myself feeling like, oh my God, like that looking at myself in a mirror, like, you know, when I was in that situation and it's so hard to not give tough love in that way. So that's why I was mm-hmm. really excited to ask you these questions because I need learning as well. Like I need to learn how to deal with these situations when I see people going through it because I am a person of tough love I am a softy as well but because it's so frustrating because I'm like I want the best for you yeah you know? absolutely but that's that's a really good quality you know to want to look out for your friends and mm. like um make sure that they're doing okay and for them to know that they deserve to be happy you know and to be loved actually properly healthily loved by their partner so like that is a thing to be celebrated that you're a good and loyal friend so mm-hmm. Um, don't be too hard on yourself <laughs> um, but you know with with any friend it's it's just about learning to uh, how to approach the situation you know I didn't know any of this stuff until I wor- started working for Women's Aid and I've learned so much since I started working for them um, but 
because we're not taught this stuff in school you know we're not taught this anywhere so yeah we do have to go out and do a little bit of homework but that stuff is out there like the resources the information is out there you just have to go and look for it and do you do outreach programs in schools? Do you go do talks in schools as well? No, we don't do schools at the moment. So um, the age group is 18 to 25 because oh, okay. under 18s would be considered a minor. Mm. Um, so unfortunately, it's just due to resources that we're not able to um, focus on under 18s just yet. Okay. But all the information that's on the website is relevant to people under 18, like all the red flags, all the types of abuse, the help a friend guide, all of that is there you know so anyone of any age can go on there um but we do talks with organizations things like that uh but there's definitely a need i think to extend the project to under 18s um at the moment it's just me working on it so (laughs) hopefully uh we'll have some more people on the team soon enough and we can expand it um but you know there's been some good developments with like the curriculums in school curricula sorry um <laughs> in schools you know um like the RSE and the SPG program like they're kind of making strides in um revising that to include like um relationships and abuse and violence and consent and things like that which you know we need to be teaching young people that mm. earlier rather than then later on yeah and I know you touched on Love Island and I love watching Love Island to mm. psychoanalyze it's my favorite activity. oh yeah I'm obsessed with it but it's so it's brilliant because now I don't agree with reality TV on a whole because it's just like oh it's weird it's yeah. literally dystopian sometimes if you think about it too much like the Hunger Games but anyway <laughs> um, if you uh, if you can use them as examples you know Love Island and the way the people behave especially last year I think mm. it was it was h- horrible it was repulsive how some of the guys in there were reacting and it was one of the years where they got the most ever complaints Mm -hmm. um so do you think that it's good for people to watch that and maybe to recognize when something isn't wrong or isn't isn't wrong (laughs) isn't right um because i know from a mom blogger that i follow she was watching the violent with her children and she had a daughter there and a son and she was really paying attention to how her son was reacting mm-hmm. and then she was proud of him by because he was calling out behaviours that weren't right. Oh, but wow. obviously one of the fears you'd have as a parent, I know if I ever had a boy, one of my fears, what, the biggest fear would be like, what if he turns out like one of these people mm. and you would feel responsible and there's a huge pressure and blame put on parents. Well, probably rightly so. I don't know because it's your job to raise these people but um, I would be really scared at how one of my sons would grow up and maybe if I was missing something or there's there's something I should have said, but it might be so hard because of things they're consuming on the internet and all these other things. Um, but do you think that, what's the question I was trying to ask? Do you think that, number one, is it good, these types of things like Love Island for women? I think Women's Aid, is it's so good that you made the tweet about that to call it bad behaviour. Um, but also, is there anything that parents maybe can do now for their t- children who are even preschool age to teach them about um, what's normal and what's unhealthy. Yeah, I think the thing with like Love Island and reality TV and stuff, like it can be a great um, teacher, but I suppose you need to have that context to teach it. Exactly, you know, if yeah. you're just watching it on face value, like, um, you know, that's not teaching you what real relationships look like. You know, mm. if that was in the real world, like what was happening would be a big red flag for abuse. Um, but at the same time, you know, if you are there, that's amazing. Um, that, that woman, you know, was hearing that from her son, like that's, that's like the dream, you know, to hear. Um, so yeah, I suppose if you can talk about it with, um, not kids, kids obviously shouldn't be watching Love Island, but you know, (laughs) you know, if you teenage kids, um, to be talking about this stuff, absolutely. Like that is so important. And like Keelan to say to you you know the fact that you're worried about that at all shows that I don't think that will be a problem because you're already thinking about it and you don't even have a son <laughs> <laughs> so um, I think you're ahead of yourself so but like that that's the thing you know to be think- thinking about this to be talking about this to the people in your life you know not just um mothers but for like friends to be talking about this to be talking about relationships to normalize like calling out things that are unhealthy or normalizing you know your friends knowing that um that your friendship circle is a safe space you know and that it won't be judgmental or you know in the girl's bathroom like that's a huge place of like you know learning and growing like calling out things there um you know in school in work 
I think if if it becomes more part of the uh, national conversation, it becomes more normal and then it becomes less of a big deal when somebody has to talk about it in relation to themselves, if that makes sense. Yeah. And um, probably to finish this off, um, could you just talk a little bit where people can go for help? And also, are your services available for men as well? I know it's called Women's Aid, but men can, I assume. I was going to ask that. And yeah. then I was like, <laughs> do I? <laughs> so anyone can uh, contact Women's Aid, yeah. um, but there are uh, specific supports available for men experiencing um, violence and abuse. So the Men's Development Network run the male advice line. Oh, brilliant. Um, and there is obviously Men's Aid as well, but we're predominantly for women. Okay. Um, so... Uh, you can contact Women's Aid on the 24 hour national free phone helpline on 1800 341 900 um, and it's completely free and confidential service and you know the um, people on the helpline have been fully trained they have a really good understanding of the complications of abuse they'll understand what you're going through they will listen to you and they will believe you Um, So, you know, if you're worried at all, you don't have to be 100% sure that what you're experiencing is abuse. If anything feels off at all, please do reach out to us. And that's, you know, if it's for yourself or for a friend or a family member, that service is there. Um, And that's also available in um, over 170 languages. So we have an interpretation service as well if English is in your first language. That's brilliant. That's amazing. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. Um, and we also have um, a tech service for deaf or hard of hearing people as well. Um, and then at the Two Into You website, we have our chat service. So that's run by the same helpline team. Um, and that's a free and confidential space, just if you don't want to make a call. So we set that up with young people in mind because who likes making a phone call anymore? Mm. Um, so that's there. And also on the website, we have a relationship quiz. So, if you know, if there's anything you heard today and you're like, oh, that sounds a bit familiar, um, go to two and two dot IE and there's a quiz there and it's just 10 questions and it can tell you if your relationship is healthy or unhealthy and things to look out for. So it's worth giving a shot and it's free and please do uh, tell your friends about it. And um, also if people can follow us on social media and share the campaign, um, it would be a huge help, not just to us, but also to the people in your lives. You never know who might need to know that, you know, those services are out there. So we're at two into you on Instagram, Twitter, and now TikTok as well. Great. Amazing. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you. I've learned so much. Yeah, me too. Thank you so much. Thanks, Mel.